and welcome back to the What The Folk Sunderland Review Show. It was a performance that had much to admire as Sunderland left Premier League Fulham with a richly deserved 1-1 draw and will replay again next Tuesday or Wednesday. However, the game did come at a cost as the best striker on earth, in my humble opinion, left the field on a stretcher and looks set to be out for some time with an Achilles injury. Hopefully not, though. Um, we'll have the usual suspects with us today, minus one, as we dig through Sunderland's draw in West London. First and foremost, we have Ross Black. Ross, how are you doing, mate? You OK? Aye, uh, just a bit gutted about Ross Stewart, but I'm sure we'll get on to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dave, I'll give you a minute because you're chucking That's something down your throat, which sounds wrong in hindsight, but uh, <laughs> how are you? Yeah, not bad. Just having a little diet coke break. Bad timing. But uh, yeah, plenty football, isn't it? Plenty of positives. The biggest negative possible. But yeah, no, nothing's bigger than the club. I hope Roscoe gets looked after in every sense of the sense of the phrase. Um, but yeah, still a lot of positives to take from the day, I guess. So yeah, yin and yang. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we'll, we like to always start with the positives and thankfully the season has been absolutely loads. Today's no exception, Ross. Um, a 1-1 draw, obviously we're going to go to replay. I don't think any of us really wanted a replay, but it was a, it was a good performance. How were you feeling about the game today? Aye, oh, brilliant. We played some of our best football this season at times. I'm slightly frustrated that we didn't win. You know, the chances we had, especially Robertson Diallo, uh, and one from Bar, and then we thought we had it. 15-year-old off the bench in front of 6,000 Macums, like, it, oh, it was amazing. I watched it. I was like, saying to you earlier, I was up off my city, split my pants, jumping around, celebrating, then realised it was offside and I had to sit down with my ball sack hanging out with my pants. Very sad. <laughs> but on, on, the, on the bright side, though, we were mint. I think, like, the, the commentators, I think, I can't remember who it was, I think the core commentator might be Adam Virgo, uh, and he was just saying like Sunderland are really having a good go here and they're playing brilliantly and before the game they were like oh, uh, be interested to have Sunderland hang on and see if they can sit in and take the pressure I was like you've never seen us play this season have you we, we can't play that way we're a, we're a team that's better when we're on the, the front foot and we're pressing teams and having a go we've got the some of the best attack in, outside the Premier League so it just it makes no sense for us to sit back and just defend. And we played our strips today and I thought Jack Clark has been getting a bit of a rough time lately so I was buzzing to see him score. And I think he's he was brilliant at the start of the season. I think since the World Cup he's maybe maybe lost his momentum a bit. We're pressing from the front again and he took his, he finished it really well. And then he stint as the false nine. I thought he linked up really well with the other, the other two, Diallo and Roberts. So I... Hopefully that's the start of him coming back to form because let's be honest, we're going to need everyone else to chip in now since we've lost our uh, our number one, number one man up top. Yeah, I was really pleased for Clarky. Um, I think that he has been off form, but I think I've said a few times on this with Jack Clark. The one thing I quite like about Jack Clark is if a player's off form, the one thing I'll always ask them to never do is hide. Uh, one thing I'll never ask them to do, one thing I don't want them to do, sorry, is hide. And I don't think he ever does. I don't think Jack Clark ever does hide. And I think um, good pressing today, got him that goal. And I, I'm delighted to say he got it. Obviously, he had a good game today, I thought, alongside a lot of players, which we'll come on to. But um, ultimately, it's his name on the, the score sheet. And I think wingers, forwards, attackers, players that play in his position will be judged on that at the end of the season and um his tally doesn't look too bad and it's it's nice to see him adding to it when you know if he'd gone a little bit longer it might have been a little bit of a drug by his standards so um good for him dave uh we've had gone a little bit too deep already but how are you feeling about the game afterwards obviously there's that huge negative that we're going to come on to but i think ultimately the performance was very positive wasn't it yeah definitely uh collectively and individually which is uh which is always really nice to see so it's it's just a marker of of where we are, isn't it? it? We we're young, we're fearless, we're pretty dynamic. It's um it's all words which you you like to use and like to hear and as a fan pin good hard earned money. It's it's what you want to see. It's you know, um, yeah, replays. Maybe it's not something we're after because the squad's so 
threadbare, but to be perfectly honest, I'd imagine every single one of them in that dressing room probably fancies turning them over at the stadium light. And yeah, what is this? What what's been the the tweet going around? Twelve months ago, six nil off Bolton. Six nil off Bolton and, and now we're once again in a well, I'm sitting here doing a podcast talking about disappointed that we haven't won a game. Now, don't get me wrong, Fulham have had their chances as well. So I think a draw, in hindsight, is probably very fair. But we've had enough decent chances and enough decent player to have potentially put one over on them. But yeah, I, I just don't think there can be any complaints again. It's it, it's bliss. It, it's really weird. It's becoming, it's becoming too freaky to say that we really enjoy it. But yeah, of course, there is the... There is the horrible side of the game, which we've lost Roscoe. Listen, anyone who religiously listens to us a lot, we bang on about him week after week because of what he brings to us. We will come on to the Ross stuff. We need to go more, a bit more in depth on that. But um, yeah, ultimately, you know, really positive again. Obviously, there is that huge negative because we can't have everything nice. Um, but that's the, on paper, the, the seventh best side in, in the in England at the minute. And to be honest, as I said in the preview show, I think it's a good draw because although Fulham are the seventh best side in the league, in the Premier League, sorry, they've, they've just been promoted. Um, so it's probably a good marker to see how far off we actually are. And if that's if that game is a marker, like, well, that's not bad, is it? Um, considering I wrote a question down here, Ross, and this is not just based on today's game, it's wrote, um, based on maybe the whole season and especially the past couple of months. Bearing in mind all the problems we've had with injuries, Sunderland a little bit ahead of schedule of where we A, thought we might be, and B, even the board and directors might have thought you would be this season. Yeah, without a doubt. I think the messaging you get from Speakman and Mowbray is all about like three or four years, we'll, we'll be up there, we'll be con- we'll be expected to win games. And all. I think we'll be there next season, the way these lads are developing. I think we've overestimated how good our recruitment has been. Um, I think we expected the young lads to take a lot more time bedding in. I also think we underestimated because they joined us in League One how good the likes of Robertson Clark were and Stewart. Um, yeah, the back line as well, like Anthony Patterson, how good it was he, man. Like, so good. But this time last year, we had Hoffman in goal and he was playing for Notts County. What the fuck? Just crazy. And now he's without a doubt our 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 number one for the foreseeable and another another good good positive thing for the academy, you know. It, it took a lot it's took a lot of flack and been deprived since the Chuckle Brothers got in. But today we had Dan Neil Dan Neil running the game in the middle. Then you had Patterson in goal and then you had <laughs> young lads off the bench, fifteen year old lads off the bench on the academy. So Ah, uh, it's we are, we're ahead of schedule for me, no doubt about it. Obviously, if you have a fit squad all season, which let's be honest, you look at some teams and they do have that, and they get lucky that way. If we'd had that, I think we'd be challenging the top two. Like it sounds ridiculous because considering how good the top two are and how far away they are, but I think in the league we've mentioned like how many games is this? Nine or ten games with no strikers whatsoever. Like, and they, it wasn't, it's not like just any strikers either. The two strikers who have fantastic records when they play. And now we're missing, we could be missing both of them for the rest of the season. Sims, I hope, comes back now. I hope he came back anyways, but now I think the mess Everton's in, they're after Che Adams, seeing that. I hope they get him. Just, just get him so we can have Sims back. But also, as well, stop fucking the lad's career over. He's sitting on the bench. He's had about nine minutes game time in over a month when he was scoring goals in the championship. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm just looking at the league table here. We're four points off third and we've got a game in hand. Borough sitting in third. Uh, we've got a game in hand. <laughs> yeah, if but and maybes, but like Ross was out for a long time. Ellis Sims was out for a long time. We're going to get into injuries, but I think just to kind of go back to the the question that I asked you and maybe asked the same question to myself over ahead of schedule. 
absolutely. Um, I just, I, I kind of don't want to miss the opportunity. I know a lot of people said I don't want to go up this season. I don't agree with that. Um, not saying I'm right, but for me, I think when you've got an opportunity, you've got to grasp it. And then you cross that bridge when it comes to it. Do I think we're in the top best six sides in this in this division? Well, I think we've just played really well against a really good Fulham team. And I know Fulham's like full first team wasn't out, but there's a lot of first team players in there and a lot of players that would instantly get into any championship team pretty much. Um, and I, th- I thought we were the better side today. I think I know Dave said he thought draw was a fair result and I kind of am inclined to agree with him. But at the same time, I actually think we probably had the better chances. Um, and I had no fear going to Fulham today. Might be asking a, a silly question, mate, but are we, I had a schedule here. Is, this, um, is it an opportunity and another bit of evidence today against the Premier League team that it is an opportunity of the season if we want to take it? Massively, I think anyone who doesn't think we're ahead of schedule is um, is, is probably fooling themselves, really. But I'm also of the same thought process of you. Listen, like, what happens if next season the championship suddenly becomes stronger than it is this year and we have the perfect opportunity to get into the play-up? Listen, Borough are third. And with the greatest will in the world to our friends, we absolutely tortured them last week. Absolutely tortured them. And they're sitting third in the league. So even if the board, which I I tend to have a little inclination of agreeing with Ross, um, I I think we will hold back to a degree. Um, I don't think you're going to stop them lads in the changing room wanting to win games. Listen, they're professional footballers. They get paid for it. And they're buzzing. They're playing a decent brand of football. It's exciting. And I I said a couple of weeks ago, if we did go up playing the style of football that we do, it might well just be suited to the Premier League. Yeah, of course, you need a couple of experienced players in there. (laughs) Listen, if we still need two or three for the championship, we probably need five or six for the premiership. But there's nothing to say we couldn't do that. And and if promotion's there on offer, listen, nobody's going to turn it down. It's impossible to turn down. So, yes, I think we are massively ahead of, of where we expect to. But there is players in there. Jack Clark played Premier League football. Patrick Roberts played Premier League football. Um. You know, why not? Why not give it a go? It'll be interesting to see where we're at next Saturday against Millwall because it's a horrible place to go and try and play football. They've got a bit of a fortress down there. Um, They always have had made it a difficult place to go. But I just genuinely don't see anyone stopping us from scoring every week. Does that? Of course, we've got to keep them out the other end, but I can see us turning up and scoring not even just once. I can see us scoring two, three goals a game. Take some take some effort to turn us over if we're scoring twice a game, that's for sure. Yeah, I feel like the quality we've got going forward, like Diallo, Roberts, Jack Clark when he fancies it, Ross when he's fit. Like some of the quality we've got in those ranks, and I've not even mentioned the likes of Pritchard and stuff like that, who I think is massively quality. Um, they just give me loads of confidence, and and again, it goes back to what I said before about not being that worried about it being Fulham today. I really, really wasn't. Um, but what taken away from the attacking stuff, Anthony Patterson, Ross, you touched him a little bit before. There's loads of good individual performances, and I'm going to ask you who stood out for you. You've said Pato already, so I'll, I'll touch a little bit on Pato. Some stats today. 39 touches, 10 saves, 8 of them inside of the box, 5 long balls completed, and 1 high claim. Um, But take the stats away from that. Anyone watch the game today will see how good Anthony Patterson is. There's a really small set of fans I've noticed are not 100% sold on Anthony Patterson, but for me, bold statement here, but is he the best goalkeeper we've had at Sunderland since Jordan Pickford? Yep. He's played at the highest level since Pickford was our keeper. Um, only other championship keepers we had at the time were um, Lee Camp, who we signed 
on this day a few years ago. Oh, on the day of recording. Sorry, sorry to bring that up to everyone's memory. Faces of Graham and Dave look very grim when I mentioned his name. But yeah, Robin Reiter, Lee Camp, and now um, Premier League keeper Jason Steele. <laughs> In hell. Honestly, the world's mad in it. But I, he's, without a doubt, he's he's just came on so much. And again, it goes out to the, the goalkeeping staff I had last season, David Priest. And then, oh, his name has passed me by. So I think this feels very rude. Mark but the new Quirin. guy. Yeah, Mark oh, Quirin as well, but the, the new head of goalkeeping. The Italian sound and Yorkshireman. That's the guy. He seems a really good guy, to be fair. Um, but again, he's came on leaps and bounds. And it's very interesting and slightly worrying that Bass was brought in to be our cup keeper, basically. And he just, he just knew today. He was like, I cannot play him against this level of opposition. And it was today was a good showcase for that, just to prove how good we are. Like Five Live was supposedly saying how everyone was shocked at how brave we were. I think that's a thing about bravery. But defensively, Patterson, you mentioned him there, but another one as well. The two centre-halves. Ballard and Bart, just just so good, so good. The block off the line by Ballard, which just bounces that. off him and went to pass. <laughs> it's, it's it's just it's just that awareness as well at that age to get on the line. We we'll, we'll think recruitment wise we'll go back, but defensively, I'd be happy with leaving the defense alone, and I'd be confident in that defense even next season. I'd, I'd take it on. Obviously, there's rumours about Wright going and maybe someone else younger coming in, but I think as well, you think we didn't have certain there today, didn't have Luke 09, didn't have Billy Wright, and we still looked. We went toe to toe with a Premier League strike force, and it, not just Premier League strike force, and I know they made changes, but the, the players they brought on absolutely pissed the championship last season. Like, <laughs> Tony Mowbray was saying in the build about how good they are because they beat his Blackburn team 6 0. In, in the league <laughs> they are a very good team and um, yeah we went toe-to-toe with them like see individual performances like that just to think the defence needs a good shout out because clean sheet against Borough and didn't really give them a sniff 11v11 I think we got a bit complacent but um, aye I'm just just buzzing with how seeing a young lad in goal after getting a bit of stick proving people wrong he's one of our own end of the day we're going to touch on the Stewart stuff. I know people want to hear about it, and then we're going to go into some um, transfer stuff as well because I think there's only so much we can say about how great today was. Um, I think when we're talking about players that need shout outs, there's too many of them to shout out to this week. Michu was brilliant. Trihume was brilliant. The fans are brilliant. Always are tremendous. The, the noise, the noise in the crowd today, and we were pressing from the front and getting at them. It was like we were at home. And it was mentioned on the commentary just how loud we were, and so the stand was the, the stand was shaking when we scored. Tremendous. I never doubt them. That's the thing. I take it almost for granted because I'm just like our away fan base is just it's out of this world. It's silly sometimes, isn't it? If we can start matching the atmosphere to make away from home at home, it would scare teams. It honestly would. The stadium light when it's rocking. Yeah, we just. Yeah. Chef went at home last year. Oh, unbelievable. What an absolute... I, I literally did cottles and back. So, like, four and a half hours each way for that game. And I do not resent it at all. Like, oh, unbelievable. unbelievable. When Ross Stewart got the end of that rebound off the keeper. Absolute scenes. Brilliant. In, fa- in fairness as well, one of our is at home quickly. Because it has been a topic lately. The Blackburn game, Boxing Day, jumping. The, the Swansea game, even with 10 men, we really got behind the lads. And when we realised it was jumping. And then the Bury game, which is a stupid kick-off time, was still a really good atmosphere. Wigan was great. So, Second half, we really got behind the lads against Wigan. That was a great atmosphere as well. There's been a lot, of good, yeah. been a lot of good home atmospheres this season. Um, one player that I'm devastated that he... Didn't get the winner today. It felt a heart sorry for him. It was offside, of course. The stupidity of VAR is that if that game was at home, Chris Rigg, Chris Rigg would be celebrating a 90th minute winner this evening because VAR wouldn't have been in play. And somehow the linesman didn't give offside. But um, 
We've seen him come on against Shrewsbury. Dave, you've seen him there in the flesh. He created the corner that got us the first goal um, from Ross goal. And then he came on today and, yeah, it was offside. But obviously, he's, he's getting a team on merit. And Tony Mowbray said as much. Patted the badge today. He's unfollowed the mags on Instagram, I've noticed, because <laughs> I'm sad like that. Um, first and foremost, Dave, how disappointing was it to see the fact that his goal didn't count, bless him. But second of all, look, I know he's 15, but can he add to the squad this season? Yeah, I, I think exactly like you just said. Tony Mowbray said he's not doing it as a gimmick. I mean, to be honest, why Why would he need to have it as a gimmick, I suppose? Uh, there's there's no real reason. It's not as if it's... Uh, it's it's changing the course of the universe by playing him, but he looks very technically good. Um, and then once you start doing the comparisons that this isn't a professional footballer of four or five years, this is a fifteen year old schoolboy, and you 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 look at him and I saw him down in Shrewsbury, he played a part in both goals in some way. Um, left foot looks a little bit wicked to be honest. Um, and the fact that, by all accounts, his attitude seems absolutely spot on, fearless, brave, wants the football, but also off the ball, he's got a bit of a, a bit of agginess about him, so to speak. He, he likes putting his foot in the challenge. He doesn't care who he's playing against. It could be anyone. Um, and and I almost listen. This is a this is a big big thing, um, but. I almost see in little glimpses, and bearing in mind we have only seen like twenty odd minutes of him over two ge- two cup games, but there's almost a little bit of swagger and attitude of Wayne Rooney about him. Um, now I'm not saying for a second that he's as good as Wayne Rooney was, or is going to be as good as Wayne Rooney was at sixteen year old, but there's definitely that there's something there which <clears throat> is probably why all national outlets uh, turn around and saying that he's the most exciting teenager in the country and United and Liverpool and and everyone like that are looking at him week in, week out. Um, listen, he's obviously got scruples about money. He's unfollowed the barcodes and it's just it's just sensible. Just the right thing to do. He's, he's been brought through um, and made his decisions pretty much alongside uh, the young Mason lad, doesn't he? And he said, listen, you know, we seem to have chose right. We're, we're learning our trade. We're getting close to the first team in terms of getting on the bench and stuff and also training with the first team. And when you see us playing football the way that we do, you probably uh, you probably be quite excited to join in amongst all that, I would have thought. Ross, same question to you. Um, I don't want to put pressure on the kid at all, um, and we've just done it. So there you go. Sorry, mate. Um, but he does look good. Like, was it if they're young enough, they're old enough? Like, he's making a difference when he's coming off the bench, and it's only 20 minutes here or there. I don't think he'll... I'm not saying can he start games, can he replace Ross Stewart, but could he potentially win us some points this season by you know coming on? He, he looks like he can add stuff for me. Um, am I expecting a bit too much? Um, yeah, I think there'll be certain games where we'll be best suited to less physical sides. But even just being part of the match day squad's huge. He's a 15-year-old. He's at school doing his GCSEs. He, he's training twice a week on, on release from his school. With first, and to me, that's another thing. If he's training with the first team, and he's he's not, you know, what I mean, he's clearly shown something in training to get on the bench and get brought off the bench as well. It wasn't like when he's been brought on, we've been like three or four nil up, or three or four nil down where the game's gone. He's came on, we've been one nil down, and when we've been drawn one one with a Premier League side today, nonetheless. So I trust Mowbray to know exactly what he's doing. I think that's one thing Mowbray has definitely shown. He knows how to uh, treat and get the best out of young players. And he did a piece with the Not the Top Twenty podcast video, which was fantastic. It's on YouTube. You can see it. Did an interview with uh, George Alec there, and you can just tell he, he's 
he's fantastic for these young lads. He knows what he's doing. Kind of, we're almost past the point, aren't we? Of like, does Tony Mowbray deserve praise? We're kind of just comfortable with him now, and I think that's the ideal situation for us. But um, I don't want to come onto it. I can't be asked to come onto it. It like, I'm absolutely gutted for him, more so than us. Like, you could see in his face today, Rusty, of course, is who I'm talking about. When he went down, you could see he was gutted. Um, I'm praying that the scan's not as bad as he thinks. But obviously Achilles is not nice. I've known a few people who've done their Achilles and it's minging and it's certainly lengthy. And obviously the club have kind of prepped us, I think, for some potentially bad news to come. But, you know, let's keep our fingers crossed and try and manifest it. But looking at the injuries this season, right? So players that have suffered injuries that have kept them out for three games or more this season. Corey Evans, Dan Ballard, Dennis Serkin, Danny Barr, Elliot Embleton, Linda Gooch, Ross Stewart twice. Alex Pritchard, Edward Machu, RG Alessi, and Ellis Sims. Long term in that is Corey Evans, Dan Ballard, Elliot Embleton, Ross Stewart twice. Ellis Sims was pretty much long term because it was over two months. That's a lot of injuries. Um, Ross is obviously a, a devastating one, Dave. I f- feel like Ross is irreplaceable. I've said this before, but. I don't know, I'll throw a really difficult question to you. How do we how do we handle the fact that he's obviously potentially going to be out for the rest of the season and, and maybe more, unfortunately? Yeah. Um well, well I guess instantly everyone suddenly turns to Joe Gelthart, which is which is perfectly um understandable. Uh I get the feeling from from the way people speak about Gelhart, that he'll feel as always ready to to step into the breach, so to speak. We play. I know you'd said earlier before we came on that it, he's a he's a different player, and to be honest, I can't think of too many players out there who are like Ross Stewart in terms of the all round package that they bring to the game. Um. So in terms of dipping into the market to try and find someone to replace Ross Stewart, whether it be short term, medium term, or long term, just becomes horrible, especially especially in terms of a, a price tag, especially in January. We all know it's hard to find players. So listen, I suppose that the positive to try and take out of it is we've played for a what did we decide? Thirteen games. With a with a false nine, so to speak, um, and and we we did all right. We did all right. It wasn't you know we're fluid enough to to cope with it, and we still can have a focal point in that. We can have Geldart up there, who's probably not an out now ten, but at the same time, he's uh, he's a little bit more than a, a, a. This is what I'm guessing anyway. He's a little bit more deadly and a little bit more clinical than a Pritchard or a Diallo in there or a Jack Clark or a Patrick Roberts. So we're probably in a slightly stronger position than we were last time by having him. Um, That being said, listen, we all know I'm his biggest fan. I, I became Roscoe's biggest fan after the goal of Plymouth. I mention it time and time again because I just instantly saw a footballer who I wanted to watch and who I knew would give everything for the badge, who looked as though he wanted to be here, which I must admit could be said for a lot of our squad at the minute, which is really, really pleasing. So, yeah, absolutely huge blow. But talking out loud now, I've probably convinced myself that for as much as it's horrible for Roscoe, and it is horrible for us as a fan base, we could well be in a slightly stronger position than we were the last time we got injured long to him. Yeah, definitely. You know, Geltart's not to be sniffed at. He's a Premier League player that was playing four leads last season and, you know, to my mind, scoring goals. Not like 30, but I think he, was, he, was, he looked tidy. Um, he looked a player that probably wouldn't come back into the Championship, put it that way. Um, I've got a family member who supports Leeds and he he rates him highly. Um, Wigan fans obviously rate him very highly. 
Um, sadly, he turned them down. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think people can probably tell from my tone, even though it's been relatively positive, that I'm desperately sad about Ross. And like I say, I, I put out a tweet earlier. It's it's kind of more for him because I just feel like his career's just taken off. He's worked his absolute bollocks off to get where he's at, and he just deserves so much more than the luck he's had this season. And I pray and hope that it's not anything that's going to keep him out anything longer than like eight to 12 weeks maximum because he doesn't deserve that. At the end of the day, he's a great striker. He's one of the, my favourite players we've ever had. And I think he's absolutely massive to how we play. And I don't think there's anyone we could bring in realistically that's going to give us what Ross Stewart does. But we're going to have to do that regardless. Um, back down to one striker, Ross. Obviously, I'm going to go into transfers now before we finish. Um, we've made some really exciting signings. Geldart's a great signing. Um, Lee Hadge, I think his name is, is pronounced correctly. Um, is obviously on the golden boy list, which is just mad, by the way. So is Joe Geldard, actually. Uh, both on the golden boy list, which is a bit mad. Alongside Amad Diallo, the only three players on the golden boy list, um, I think last year or the year before, something like that, which is just mad, really. But I still feel like there's gaps in the squad a little bit. And I think Corey Evans is a huge miss. I think we'll end up seeing how much of a miss he'll be come season end. Ross, we've touched on. Um, and the luck we've had this season, I wouldn't be surprised if Danny Bart gets some kind of cruciate ligament injury by next week. Like that, that's how the luck's going. Obviously, you can't sign players on hindsight, but there's there's a lot of experience that's going out the team, and I think um, Mowbray's kind of alluded to that, which I'm pleased with because if there's one worry I had with Mowbray is that he was going to just kind of be happy to go along with this recruitment, which you know, wouldn't be the worst idea in the world because it's obviously worked. But I do think we need experience in there. And I think it's a big reason why Bailey Wright's been linked to other clubs but not actually gone yet. I, I feel like he wants to keep some experience in the squad until he's got more experience in the squad, potentially. And then we might consider the players going. But um, I'm waffling a bit now. Ross, we need to strengthen, I think. We can't go in the rest of the season with one striker. We've touched on Sims. Corey Evans is a miss as well. Um, first question, where do you think we need to sign? Second question, where do you think we'll sign? Third question, your head of recruitment, who we're going for? Oh, that's some questions. Um, first of all, we need minimum one, hopefully two strikers on top of Geldhart for me. Um an experienced centre mid, I think, would be good too. But I can see them maybe the performances of Edouard Michu changing the ways because the last two games he's been fantastic. So that might change them a bit. I think, if, especially now we need two strikers, if the budget was to stretch, I think that's where it would go rather than centre mid. Um, and I, I don't know why, but I've got a feeling that Bailey White will go. So we'll need another defender. And we've been linked with another one as we record. Everton's under 21, captain, centre-half. Suits the model perfectly. Do they feel like Ballard's experienced enough now in his second full season as a championship player? But yeah, if I'm head of recruitment now, who do I go and get? But Ellis, Ellis Sims is the perfect one everyone's talking about. The sound's coming out that he wants to come back as well. You must, you must one. want to. You, you can't, as like a 21-year-old striker, look at Sunderland in comparison to where Everton are going at the minute and think, yeah, my, my, where I'm going to be best served here is Everton sat on my fucking arse, as opposed to signing for Sunderland where, you know what, every young player seemingly under the age of 24 is like blossoming under like this granddad guy that you see from Rebels. Do you know what I mean? Like... <laughs> There's apt, like I know Ellis Sims like will want a chance in the Premier League, and I know he's probably been quite excited when he first went back because he thinks I can make a mark. But the way the first few weeks have gone, the things that have happened at Everton, he must be like fucking hell. Get me back to Sunderland. I just want to play football. I just want to score goals, and I want to like football again because, and I, I really like Everton as a football club. To use a cliche, I feel they're a proper football club. Um. But you cannot possibly be at Everton at the moment as a fan, a player, a staff member, and be enjoying football. You must want to like poke your eyes out with like hot pokers. 
Awful. Ever, Everton just remind me of what we used to be like. And then I've seen, I've even seen some of their fans saying, "Oh, maybe we need to go down and we rebuild." And I was like, "Oh God!" I remember some of our fans saying that. <laughs> and I was like, "It's just we, brought, I'm sure, like bringing we brought Connor Wickham back to survive. They've tried to bring Sims back because we didn't have any money to buy a striker. It's just, it's it just repeats itself. And but yeah, Sims no doubt will want to come back. I have no doubt about that. Um, for the second striker, I'm unsure. But do you get an experience heading like I've said or? Do we go abroad and take a gamble on a young lad? It's a shame that Nemeth has decided to go to Hamburg, but also I think he's went for a million pounds, which for someone who's out of contract for six months is a lot of money. I think if we're looking at the model and how we work. Um, but it, it's massive for Stu Harvey and Speakman now because they've got to watch that tonight and just today, sorry, and just look and say, like, look, we're not far away here. We're four points off third of a game in hand. This is we we I think as well, I think Louis Dreyfus, how much money does he does he wanna spend now? Is a big thing. Does he wanna go all out for the playoffs or does he think, well we'll we'll just we'll just get by this season. We might get the playoffs and then next season we'll have a good go for a free in the championship. It it just depends on the mindset and the budget. But it's um it's a big week, isn't it? It's huge. Obviously, we do need... Uh, yeah, for me, Sims is like a no-brainer. There's a lot of talk about Sims on loan, Dave, but um, I'd, I'd want them permanent, me. I'd test a resolve, Dave. Uh, but we need more than that. I think we probably need a midfielder. I, I know everyone likes this whole like young player thing. I like it because it works. But I think we need an experienced midfielder in there as well. Where, where would you strengthen Centre midfield, there must be someone, even if it's a saying that I don't know how many loans we've got left, but um, we still got a couple. Ross is saying so. Maybe is there someone at like a at Bournemouth, or is there someone at a Leicester, or someone who we can have for for six months who's been there, done it, and got the t-shirt a little bit? I'm not quite sure, but yeah, I'd, I'd like a centre midfielder, and I definitely think we. Uh, don't give me horrible names like Ben Pearson. What is that? See Ben. Not ben he got. He got. He got. See Ben Pearson. I think is a good shout. He's twenty eight. He's only played six, seven games for Bournemouth. He's a bit of a walking yellow card, like. But he got promoted last season. He's still at a decent age. He's probably going to give you a bit of experience, and he plays in a similar way to Corey Evans. I know because we've signed like French wonder kids, <laughs> and only French wonder kids for the past like six months. But I do think we need a bit of steel in there. I think there's there's too many times, and I know people were pointed recently where we've played with Daniel and the, the, the by the way Daniel phenomenal again today best midfielder in the world, um, but I, I know we've played recently and looked all right with that Corey Evans. But there's so many times we've looked like lost with that Corey Evans, and I think there'll be there, you're not going to get the rest of you're not going to be able to like play the rest of the season without experience. I know they say you can't win anything with kids, yada, 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 and all that kind of stuff. But I'd be really surprised if we continue to like look class without any experience in the middle. Like, I just think someone like a Ben Pearson, someone who's 28, 29, what's a Joe Rothwell as well? I know he's just come back from a, an injury um, not long ago, and I doubt Bournemouth will run a cell, if I'm completely honest. But there is players out there that you could, you know, potentially look at that could maybe do something even if just for like a temporary job on loan until Corey Evans is back because I think Corey Evans is a massive miss. I don't think that's been, um, I can't believe I'm saying it, but like, I don't think it's been played on enough. But um, yeah, there's work to do, isn't there? Uh, in the transfer window, let's be honest, there's, there's work to do. But um, I think we're going to try and have a transfer show, aren't we? Either, either previewing it or reviewing it. I, I haven't really decided yet, but we'll be doing something. Um, alongside the regular kind of review and preview shows, and um, but yeah, kind of a bittersweet day in many ways. We've obviously seen the season that we can compete with the best in the championship. We've seen the day that we can, on our day, compete with a, a Premier League team, and on the same token, we've lost our key player, and um, probably for the end of the season. I pray that's not true, and, and pray that's not the case. So, a difficult one to take, but ultimately, like, there's no point in being negative about it. We've 
got far more positives than negatives this season. We've bounced back a million and one times from losing our manager, losing Ross Stewart once, losing our second striker, losing Pritchard, losing X, Y and Z and everything that could have went against us has went against us this season and yet we're still here and we're still incredibly happy. But um, Ross, Dave, thanks for joining me. I wish it was completely positive. Sadly, it's not. Um, but I'm sure, as it has been most of this season, it'll remain positive moving forward. Um, and I look forward to the the transfer window where we sign a few more players from that list of golden boys, just to add to the squad because we can. Um, thanks very much. Cheers, buddy. Cheers, mate.